So thank you very much for having me. Uh, so this talk is going to be about uh, a couple projects on using dictionaries to build um, what I'll call web scale, or you can think of as large scale uh, language technology. So this is work with some colleagues uh, at Google. So before getting to that, uh, I just want to point out that obviously dictionaries at Google are extremely important. Uh, if you type a word and then the word definition right after it, you're going to get this structured field uh, where uh, we show a dictionary entry that's been digested from uh, different sources. Uh, and this is a feature that people uh, use a lot and uh, find uh, quite helpful for a lot of the searches they're doing. This is not only true for sort of monolingual search. Uh, translation has a very similar API. If you enter a word, uh, you get a nice uh, multilingual uh, or bilingual dictionary entry for that. And many other products uh, use dictionaries uh, kind of as a core feature to give users the information. So this talk, though, is not going to be about um, how we surface these dictionaries uh, you know, or the kind of features that we have uh, for these dictionaries. Instead, what this talk is going to be about is how can we leverage the fact that we have all this lexical knowledge uh, available to us uh, to improve core natural language processing uh, tasks. So uh, I think many people here are familiar with natural language processing, but to just go over it briefly. Basically, it's the study of algorithms that try to process and distill uh, uh, human language as good as or, or better than humans, uh, which uh, you can think of the field as being bro broken down into the study of a number of different uh, subtasks. Anywhere from kind of simple uh, syntactic categories, so assigning part of speech tags, uh, to every word in this sentence. So this is, I went to Pilos in the East Village and their Saganaki was to die for. Uh, going a little bit deeper in terms of syntax, actually trying to predict what the syntactic relationships are between the words in the sentence. So what's the main verb? What are the subclauses? Subjects, objects? Is there a coordination phrase that needs to be handled? Uh, things of that nature. On the surface level, uh, surface sem semantic level, um, trying to identify the real world entities, maybe assigning some type to that entity, or maybe even resolving that entity uh, in some database of, of known entities. So we know that this Pilos, there's probably uh, multiple businesses, there's at least an island and, and a restaurant, uh, but we know that this particular mention of Pilos refers to some uh, canonical representation in a database. We also want to learn relations between these entities uh, and maybe uh, common nouns as well. This often relies uh, on our ability to do things like co-reference, so we need to know that this particular pronoun uh, has the antecedent uh, pilos, uh, so that we can uh, figure out that Saganaki is actually being served by uh, this restaurant. And uh, even you know, further up the semantic uh, uh, chain, and this is more of an application-based uh, task is something like sentiment analysis, where what we might want to do with all these kinds of analyses is understand that, well, Saganaki is a kind of food. Um, was to die for is a way of expressing uh, a positive uh, opinion about something. Uh, and the syntactic relationships and the co-reference relationships tell us um, that this person has a positive opinion about the food at Pilos. And there's a lot of other tasks that uh, natural language pr uh, processing uh, practitioners busy themselves with. This is just uh, a subset. Uh, and the case studies that I'm going to look at uh, are kind of at the spectrum, at the low level uh, part of speech tagging uh, and at a more high level sentiment analysis and, and show you some case studies where dictionaries uh, can improve uh, the accuracy of these systems dramatically. Uh, and just so you know, this is not just uh, an academic exercise to uh, create these kinds of constructions. Uh, NLP is critical nowadays in a number of different user-facing technologies. Uh, one is search. So uh, we're increasingly analyzing not only documents and queries with different syntactic and semantic information. Uh, translation is obviously another example where we do a lot of uh, syntactic and semantic analysis of a source sentence in order to translate it correctly, or try to translate it correctly, I should say. Um, and then uh, recently, uh, Siri and Google Now, these sorts of voice action systems where we try to uh, understand what a user is telling their phone to do for them, uh, and we want to do some sort of syntactic or semantic analysis to try to fill in some slots of some semantic uh, templates. So these natural language processing components are used all the way downstream in these kinds of technologies. 
Okay, so it, it might sound strange to have a talk around how we can use dictionaries to improve language technology, since on the face of it, it seems like an obvious thing uh, that you would do. Uh, and to sort of motivate why this is an interesting question uh, today, I want to give you a little bit of NLP history for those who, who aren't aware of it. So natural language processing or computational linguistics has been around, you know, the, the modern incarnation of it has been around since the mid 20th century. And from that point until about the mid 1990s, uh, methods were, were dominated by ontologies, lexical ontologies, gr you know, grammar formalisms, uh, and the job of the NLP researcher was to write rules uh, that uh, consume that information, um, consume text, and did something intelligent with that text so we can get an analysis we cared about, uh, you know, on the other end. And while people were, bu were building these systems, they realized that there was a lot of problems with this kind of approach. One is labor intensive, so humans are in the loop at every single point uh, in this process, defining the ontologies, defining the formalisms, uh, and defining the rules, so you have a slow development cycle. You also have this issue that these systems are uh, brittle, they don't model uncertainty. If there's a certain lexical item that's not in uh, the ontology, uh, the system will often just not uh, return any sort of analysis. Um, and another major problem, which is what I, the main kind of focus of, of what I want to talk about today, is that often, because we rely on ontologies and formalisms built by humans, uh, we get poor coverage in a couple dimensions, along a couple dimensions. The first is uh, often these uh, ontologies are, are built uh, with well-formed uh, text in mind, so newswire text or, or things like that. Uh, and often they're hard to internationalize because they cost a lot of money to make, uh, and so we may have them for English, European languages, uh, some other uh, languages with a lot of speakers, but there's a tale of languages for which we would not have these kinds of resources or uh, the coverage is a little bit spotty. So with these kinds of observations in mind, uh, there was what some people call a statistical revolution in natural language processing in the mid-90s. And this happened uh, in many different fields, not just uh, natural language processing. And basically there, uh, at least at the beginning, uh, practitioners switched over to basically a reliance on what I'll call supervised learning. And here, the idea is that the linguist or the lexicographer, uh, whoever is the domain expert, uh, instead of telling us facts about the language in an ontology, uh, we'll look at a bunch of examples like John likes Mary, and then they'll just tell us, okay, uh, of the possible ways of analyzing the sentence in terms of part of speech tag, uh, this, is the, this is the right analysis. Then what we'll do is take a statistical model, uh, and it can be any favorite statistical model you have. This is a conditional random field, um, just a conditional probability model. The linguist will then collect a huge amount of examples of input sentences uh, and corresponding correct outputs, uh, part of speech tag sequences here. We'll feed that into the statistical model, and the statistical model will basically uh, set its parameters, theta in this case, to put as much mass as possible on the analysis that the linguist said was correct, and it has to do that by taking probability mass away from all the other uh, analyses. And so post-1995, there was a lot of fields in natural language processing that basically built systems purely from annotated data of this form. They basically threw out things like formal grammars, um, dictionaries, uh, and other lexical ontologies, and they just relied purely on, on this kind of data. And part of the reason was because statistical models were still relatively new to that community, and it was, I think, easier to think about them without having to worry about external uh, linguistic uh, constraints. Uh, this is a, a simplification. There certainly were cases, especially in morphology, uh, uh, word census ambiguation, where lexical resources still played an important role. But especially in areas like syntax, uh, these kinds of resources uh, were not used for many years. And the result of that, you know, people thought was pretty positive. So, for instance, the sentence, the crumpets, nork, the coof with the schlap, uh, a parser does perfectly well in this sentence, and that's because uh, the morphological information, the word order information, these kinds of features that the statistical model can look at, it can kind of figure out what is the most likely uh, analysis here, the same way you could if uh, you, know, you had never seen these words before. So what's different now? So I think 
we're in, entering a, a really interesting uh, point in the development of natural language processing tools. Uh, on the one hand, we've had about 20 years of PhD thesis on building statistical natural language processing systems. So we have a much better understanding, uh, especially with respect to how these things interact with language learning. Um, how do we incorporate linguistic constraints, either hard or soft, uh, without overwhelming the learner? Um, and on top of that, in the, uh, uh, the same 20 years, uh, as many of you know, the amount of online resources, the amount of available resources has just exploded. So we have a, a lot more rich information from which to pull into these systems that have much better coverage today uh, than they did 20 years ago. Uh, and even uh, you have projects like the Open Multilingual WordNet, which covers 30 or 40 uh, different languages. So a lot of these resources are also uh, massively internationalized, um, at least up to 50, 100 languages. So Wiktionary, uh, as many of you know, is a crowdsourced uh, dictionary. I think currently has about 170 languages covered. OK, so with that motivation in mind, uh, this is a, a rough outline of the rest of the talk. So I'm going to start by defining a very um, broad concept, semi-supervised learning, as the, the main framework from which uh, I'm going to take advantage of label data, which is now the traditional use case in natural language processing, while also pulling in uh, lexical information in order to uh, improve the accuracy of the systems. Uh, and when I cover that broad, uh, that sort of umbrella topic, uh, then I'll give you two case studies to make it concrete actually what I mean. So the first one is going to be building uh, international part of speech taggers. So here uh, we don't only want to build part of speech taggers maybe for data or languages for which we have a lot of data, but we want to build part of speech taggers for every single language uh, in the world, or at least every single language in which we have a dictionary, because uh, we need some kind of resource to build something. Uh, and then the second case study is going to be uh, building web scale sentiment lexicon. So how do we build um, dictionaries of words that uh, convey that word or that phrase's uh, implied uh, opinion about a, a topic? Uh, and we're going to grow these lexicons from uh, small human generated dictionaries. And so again, to sort of hammer home the point, the really what I want to talk about here is large scale. So not just uh, building these systems for a restricted domain uh, or a particular language like English. We want to develop techniques that are going to work for every single language in the world. Again, if, assuming we have a dictionary or some other resource in that language uh, and for every possible domain we might want to cover. Okay, so semi-supervised learning is going to be a mix of fully supervised learning and unsupervised learning. So fully supervised learning is uh, what I showed you before. Uh, a linguist sits down, annotates a bunch of examples. This is quite expensive. Uh, if you imagine every single domain, every single language, uh, every single task that we, gonna, we require data for, it's not feasible um, to get that information. Uh, uh, at least it's not feasible to get it today. So in response to this uh, problem, which is both kind of a, uh, a practical but also a uh, economical problem, uh, the NLP research community started developing models that I'll call fully unsupervised models. But the idea is that we don't even want the linguist to tell us anything. We're just going to take a huge amount of raw data and we're just going to learn something from that data. And really, when you think about it, you know, you can learn things, uh, collocations, co-occurrence statistics, maybe how to cluster words, but you can't really do anything beyond this kind of distributional information about how words occur with other words in text. It's really hard to go from that kind of statistic to something like a full-scale sentiment analysis system or a full-scale semantic analyzer. So not surprisingly, after 20 years of research, um, the accuracy of these kinds of systems is much, much less than the accuracy of systems that use a huge amount of labeled data. And it takes maybe a linguist only annotating a hundred, couple hundred uh, instances for most tasks to already be uh, dramatically, to build systems that are dramatically more accurate than an unsupervised system. So semi-supervised learning is basically the, the field that is trying to, to reconcile both. So we want to take advantage of these rich labeled uh, instances when we have them um, so that the model can, can learn from them. But we also want to take advantage of just the massive amount of raw data that's available nowadays. And this data can come 
you know, it can be general, it can come from the web, or it can come from a particular domain if you're building an application for that domain. So traditionally in machine learning, uh, the idea of semi-supervised learning uh, took the they took the view that the raw data should remain raw, right? So the kind of statistics we extract from that shouldn't be anything beyond the, the words and how they co-occur with each other uh, in that text. What I'm gonna suggest here is that we also use our domain expert um, uh, to get information. Now they're not gonna label this raw data for us, but they're going to tell us something about the raw data so that we can constrain the models. A large part of machine learning is trying to put constraints uh, on the potential output space so that the, the learner has a much smaller space uh, in which to uh, move its parameters about. And by constraining the model, we end up building much more accurate models. And since you know, humans have a lot of information about language, uh, we should use uh, that information to constrain what we know about these raw texts. And then this is where dictionaries uh, are gonna come into play. So in, in the two case studies I give you, um, basically dictionaries are gonna play the role in adding constraints to huge amounts of raw data when we learn these large uh, language technologies, uh, sentiment analysis, things like that. Okay, so, Dictionaries have a lot of information. Um, I'm only gonna use a, a sub, small subset of that information. Um, obviously, if I'm talking about part of speech tag, part of speech tagging, uh, I wanna use the fact that most dictionaries do break down um, uh, the particular string by the kinds of part of speech tags it can take, uh, as well as give uh, example use cases or example senses of that part of speech tag. What we're gonna use in the sentiment analysis uh, talk is uh, synonyms. So from thesauri, dictionaries, WordNet, we often get lists of synonyms, we get links uh, to those, the definitions of those words. We also get antonyms uh, in a lot of cases, which can be uh, quite useful. On top of that, um, as you know, we have definitions, examples, pronunciation, etymology. Uh, we often have bilingual uh, information. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, at the end about how we can use some of these bilingual dictionaries for language technology uh, beyond the obvious uh, applications in machine translation. Uh, but I'm gonna sort of leave these other sources of information for future work. And I think essentially in natural lang language processing, we're not leveraging this large body uh, of, of, of resources uh, to improve technology right now. Okay, so with, with that, uh, let me make this a little bit more concrete and talk about part of speech tagging. But here, the goal is gonna be not to just build a English part of speech tagger. We wanna build a part of speech tagger uh, for let's say, um, 170 languages since we have Wiktionary in 170 languages. So, as I mentioned before, um, in the past 20 years, people have tended to build uh, part of speech taggers by having linguists label a huge amount of data. Uh, it's been very successful. We have very accurate uh, part of speech taggers these days. But as you can imagine, ex extremely English heavy. Uh, there are some Indo-European languages, uh, other languages, Chinese, Japanese, Arabic. Uh, the size and quality uh, definitely differs depending on the language. Often these tree banks are made by uh, an academic who lives in that particular country and depending on the resources, uh, we may only have a few thousand uh, examples which makes it difficult for a uh, machine learning algorithm to actually latch on to anything. Uh, and then there's areas of the globe where we basically have almost no coverage, so Southeast Asia is, is one of them. But we do have these dictionaries. Uh, as I mentioned before, we have words with the part of speech tags, so we're gonna be able to use that. Uh, we also have, if we wanna go beyond part of speech tagging, uh, we also have a lot of pedagogical tools. There's also things like the World Atlas of Language Structure that tell us things about, uh, in different languages, uh, how, what is the relative order of subjects, objects, and verbs, and all these resources can help constrain the model uh, in interesting ways. Uh, but for, for this particular application, we're gonna use Wiktionary. Uh, part of the reason is that it's readily available. Um, it's in 170 languages, uh, and also for experimental uh, replication, uh, everybody has access to it. Okay, so how can we use Wiktionary to 
um, set up a set of constraints from which we can learn. So a, a little bit of notation here. Uh, I'm going to let C of x, it's actually not that important. I'm only going to use it in one more slide, but um, bear with me. Uh, I'm going to let C of x represent a set of input-output constraints. So for an input sentence x, C of x represents a set of constraints on um, substructures that the output might take. Y of C basically represents the set of possible outputs for that input sentence X. So this could be the set of possible part of speech tag sequences that are consistent with the constraints defined by C of X. So an example, if the sentence is I like work, maybe I have a dictionary that tells me I can be a pronoun, work can be a noun or verb, maybe it's a really bad dictionary and it doesn't know anything about the word like, uh, so I just have these constraints. In this case, Y of C is going to be represented by a lattice, where the first location in the lattice basically says that I has to be a pronoun. The last location only licenses uh, the verb and noun tag. And the middle location basically doesn't know anything, so it licenses all possible tags. Uh, so you can think of any path in this lattice from, from left to right as being a uh, licensed uh, output. So how can we learn uh, with such constraints? So instead of having the linguist label uh, a particular instance for us, we're going to, on a huge amount of raw data, and that's the key here, because uh, we don't actually need a linguist to look at any, set, uh, any uh, particular set of data. Here we can just leverage all the data we have. Uh, we're going to have a dictionary tell us, you know, of the possible outputs, which ones are consistent uh, with these constraints, and maybe even tell us which ones are partially consistent uh, with the constraints. The learning is going to change slightly. So this is a latent variable CRF uh, model that's been developed uh, in the past 10 years or so. Uh, and here, what changes is that instead of the training data being input-output pairs, which is an input sentence and the correct part of speech tag sequence, the training data now is input sentences and constraints on that input sentence. And before, where we moved probability mass towards the single correct output uh, that the linguist had told us was correct. Uh, now we're going to move mass. This is what the summation represents. We're going to move mass towards all the outputs that are consistent with the constraints. And so that would look something like this. And depending on the probability model you want to use and how you want to regularize it, you may want to reserve some mass for um, uh, outputs that are only partially consistent with the constraints. Uh, and the nice thing about this formulation is it's completely compatible with the original uh, labeled formulation. Um, it has um, some nice properties that it's differentiable, so all our normal optimization techniques work. Uh, it's not convex, but it's, it's depending on the constraints, it's not a big problem. Okay, so as I mentioned before, the way we get those constraints is through a dictionary. We're going to use Wiktionary. Uh, Wiktionary and dictionaries in general have uh, a very nice property that I'm going to contrast with uh, my next point, uh, that they tend to be high precision. So if they license a particular tag uh, for a word, it's almost always correct. Um, however, the coverage can be low. So on a set of 15 languages, we try to match particular words against Wiktionary, of course, trying to correct for things like uh, different inflection between the texts we have, or different tokenization between the texts we have and what Wiktionary uses. And it only covers about 65% of tokens. So for 35% uh, of tokens, we don't know anything about that particular word. Um, a lot of these are proper nouns that uh, tend to be underrepresented uh, in Wiktionary. Uh, and, of course, Wiktionary leaves ambiguity, right? So a lot of words, it's only going to tell you that this word to in Greek can be a pronoun or a preposition, but it's not going to tell you which one it is uh, in context. So if we go back to the semi-supervised learning uh, paradigm, basically, on this side, for part of speech tagging, Wiktionary is going to give us our dictionary constraints. We could simply say that, well, on this side, uh, we just get a bunch of labeled data and, and we're done. But this is expensive, especially if we want to do it for all the world's languages. Certainly for the 10 to 20 uh, languages in which we have annotated data, we can do this. But for the, the long tail of languages, uh, that's difficult. So we can't assume we're going to do this. So uh, in this particular application, we're going to play a little trick. Uh, and this trick has been uh, around. Uh, for about 10 years in natural language processing. And we're going to use English data, English label data. And we're going to couple this uh, with parallel data to get around uh, the problem. 
So uh, we have lots of parallel data. It comes from things like European parliaments, uh, translated books, things of this nature, where we have sentences in English and then a foreign sentence. Uh, and we have, uh, let's say, automatic ways of finding word alignments between uh, the words. So these lines between the words uh, are not given by the human translator. They're automatically inferred uh, from the data. And so it's been popular to build uh, multilingual syntactic analyzers for languages that don't necessarily have labeled data by using this analyze and project method. So we take all the labeled data we have for English. We train our best uh, part of speech tag or syntactic analyzer for English. We then analyze the English side uh, of this uh, sentence pair. And then we project across to the Greek side. And this, this does work pretty well. Uh, you can see where it breaks. Um, some words just don't align, and that could be because, in this case, um, uh, Greek uses a determiner when talking about kids, but uh, English, we wouldn't use it. Also, the translations might not be literal. Maybe one person uses a verbal predicate, another person uses a nominal predicate, or something like that, and so we're not going to get uh, perfect alignments. And then we're also going to get errors, because the alignments are automatic. So in English, we use the possessive, uh, which is marked a particle. In Greek, we use the genitive construction. And so this two here is a preposition. Maybe a multi-word uh, uh, English verb, we uh, accidentally transfer over uh, the adverb because we didn't use uh, an adverb uh, in Greek, or we didn't need to use the adverb. So we also get mistakes. So this is where putting it together in the semi-supervised learning framework is going to help. So on the one hand, we have what I'll call the supervised or parallel data setting. So we have one analysis of the sentence in Greek. And on the other hand, we have this dictionary analysis, which has more ambiguity uh, because it doesn't tell us anything about how those words, uh, what part of speech tags those words should get in that context. It just tells us you know, what are the possible part of speech tags it can get. And so we're basically just going to couple this information. And by that, I mean, in some sense, set intersection. We're going to take the two ways of analyzing the sentence and take the intersection of them. So for the first word, ta, the dictionary says it's a determiner. The parallel data, we don't know anything about it, so we're going to say it's a determiner. Uh, the second word, they both agree. That's fine. This word, to, is kind of an interesting case where uh, we made this uh, mistake. Uh, transferring it across uh, as a particle. But the dictionary tells us it can only be a pronoun or a preposition uh, in Greek. And so when the intersection is zero like this, uh, we trust the dictionary. Uh, and this is for the reason that the dictionary tends to be more precise. So if a word is in the dictionary, the analysis tends to be more correct. We keep taking intersections. Again, we correct this etrexen, this ran over mistake. We continue uh, until we get this lattice. Uh, and what we've done here, by taking advantage of some English labeled data and some dictionary constraints, we've created this output lattice where we've eliminated all the possible errors and we've left a single source of ambiguity, right? So where we had lots of ambiguity before, we now have this one word and it, it turns out that this is a very easy uh, source of ambiguity for the learner to figure out that this is, should be a preposition. Okay. So how do these things do uh, in practice? Uh, so we can only really evaluate uh, these methods on languages for which we have labeled data. Uh, so this is from 15 uh, data sets from 15 different languages that came from a uh, shared task on syntactic analysis. Uh, and so what we'll do is we'll uh, train up the system as I described for these languages. We'll run it on these data sets and we'll just count the number of times that the part of speech tagger correctly identified the right word. And that's, it's simply just accuracy. So if we take this uh, parallel data approach or the English labeled approach, we get about 87% accuracy. So it's pretty good. Uh, if we take just the dictionary approach, so we train each of these components in isolation and we only train the dictionary component in isolation, we do about the same. It's about 86% accurate, so that's fine. But when we couple the constraints, when we leverage both the labeled data that we have, as well as dictionary constraints on a huge amount of unlabeled data, we basically cut off half of the errors that were being made uh, by either of the original uh, systems. So this is quite powerful. 
uh, especially uh, for building multilingual part of speech taggers. So now we can basically build multilingual part of speech taggers that have a reasonable level of accuracy uh, for at least 100 languages uh, in order to build um, further downstream technology systems. OK, so that's part of speech tagging. The second case study uh, I want to give you is uh, building web scale sentiment lexicons. So this might be a bit small for people to read. Uh, so for those who aren't familiar with sentiment analysis, um, basically it's the study of methods to try to assign to given utterances, uh, whether those utterances are subjective or objective. If they're subjective, do they have positive or negative uh, is it a positive or negative opinion? Is there some other kind of uh, emotional attribute that can be associated to that text? Maybe that text is about a particular entity or a particular facet of that entity. So maybe it's about uh, the design of a particular uh, digital camera uh, in this case. And how do we aggregate that information? So do that low level analysis and aggregate that information uh, to give it to users. Uh, and there's it's a very well-studied field these days. Uh, there's a couple books here. If you search sentiment analysis and books on Google, these will be uh, the two top uh, items, and they're both quite good. OK, so a core component of sentiment analysis uh, is uh, what people typically call polarity or sentiment lexicons. Oh, lexicons is misspelled. That's great. Uh, <laughs> so basically, in the most simplest form, uh, these uh, you can think of this as simply two lists, uh, a list of positive words or phrases and a list of negative uh, words or phrases uh, that will get used by the sentiment analysis system. So people have studied how do we build these lexicons uh, for many years. Uh, historically, they focus primarily on adjectives, nouns, verbs, adverbs, single words uh, in these kinds of lexicons, uh, and often rely totally on curated uh, resources, which, as you can imagine, made it hard to uh, internationalize, since we don't have these resources for all our languages, uh, as well as apply on lots of different domains, because people don't just express opinion through adjectives, right? We have lots of different rich ways of, of expressing opinion. So lexicons, so building a sentiment lexicon is not kind of the be all and end all of sentiment analysis. Uh, the way we're going to use this lexicon is basically through a standard classifier. So the classifier can take a rule-based form. It can be a machine learned classifier, uh, what have you. But basically, the way these things typically get used is the classifier will take an input sentence, like the concert was sick. Uh, it'll take the lexicon. It'll use that lexicon either to derive features or derive some hard rules about that sentence. And it will spit out some prediction, basically, that it thinks this sentence uh, this person had a positive opinion about the concert, uh, or a negative opinion, or maybe a mixed opinion, uh, whatever the categorization uh, might be. So in that classification context, let me sort of get back to the, the, the overall paradigm uh, that uh, I introduced earlier, semi-supervised learning. Um, here on the raw text side, uh, what we're going to use is uh, WordNet coupled with a lot of raw text. Uh, to generate these lexicons. And this doesn't have to be WordNet. It can be basically uh, anything that gives you some notion of semantic similarity uh, between words. Uh, we're going to use WordNet. Right away, we can, of course, use that lexicon to start classifying sentences. If you have uh, a sentiment lexicon like this, you can just say, OK, well, count the number of words that are positive in the sentence, count the number of words that are negative, you know, do some kind of voting, and, and make a prediction. Uh, and that does reasonably well. Uh, but what we're going to do is assume that we're going to couple this with some labeled data. So sentiment analysis is actually an area where it is pretty cheap uh, to get labeled data, particularly of the form uh, this person thought this sentence or, or was trying to convey a positive opinion uh, in this sentence. Uh, so we're going to couple labeled data with these lexicons uh, in order to build these classifiers. I'm going to spend most of my time on the lexicon construction, because I think that's the, the more interesting aspect here. So how have people built polarity lexicons uh, in the past? Uh, probably the most common strategy uh, would fall under the umbrella of graph propagation. Uh, and so these are algorithms that have been developed in the last 10 years, um, and uh, they've 
very popular and they're used for a number of different tasks. But in the context of building sentiment lexicons, the way they're typically used is we'll start with some lexical affinity graph like this. Uh, we'll then have a human or maybe some kind of dictionary tell us uh, a few phrases that are positive, a few phrases that are negative, that convey positive or negative uh, opinion. We'll then mark those phrases in this graph, usually by giving them a score from one to negative one, uh, one being positive, negative one uh, being negative. Uh, and then we're just going to propagate information out over the graph, usually with some kind of decaying function. And you get nice interactions here. Uh, you know, if a word is close to multiple seeds, you'll get an amplification effect. Uh, if a word is in between multiple positive and negative seeds, you'll get some kind of cancellation. And so ultimately, you're going to be able to assign scores to each of these words. So the interesting questions, I think, are uh, where do the seeds come from themselves? And I think much more interestingly is that uh, where, do, where does this graph come from, right? This is kind of the crux of, of how we're going to build these lexicons. So where do the seeds come from? Uh, I'll have one slide on this. Basically, people and dictionaries. Uh, the most common uh, one is the General Enquirer, which was developed in the 60s. I don't know if your people here are familiar with it. But basically, it is a dictionary, amongst other things, tries to associate uh, some kind of emotional state to uh, a number of different words. Uh, since then, there's been a lot of efforts to expand these uh, manually and semi-automatically. Um, semi uh, the Pittsburgh Sentiment Lexicon is probably one of the more popular resources. Uh, there's even a sentiment analysis lexicon that sits on top of WordNet uh, called the Senti WordNet. Uh, Senti WordNet. Uh, but there's a lot of different uh, options here. What's more interesting is where does this graph come from? And this is where I think dictionaries are going to play the more critical component. So, right, we can take something like WordNet, uh, say every word uh, in WordNet is a node in this graph, uh, and then we can basically put an arc between every pair of words that's in some synset in WordNet, uh, and we'll get a pretty reasonable lexical affinity graph. Um, we can even take things like antonyms uh, and maybe have uh, negative, weight, negative weighted uh, edges between words so that uh, polarity can uh, be inverted as it flows through the graph. Uh, and it, the key thing here is this can be any, uh, any dictionary you want. Uh, for our experiments, again, we're going to use uh, WordNet. One problem, though, especially when using WordNet, is uh, that these curated resources um, often don't cover all the kind of language that we care about. And this can mean something like multi-word expressions, but it can also mean uh, ways people spell words on social media or different idioms like that. So to address this, we actually looked at a different way of generating this lexical graph. So this is where the raw data is going to come in. Uh, so we basically took the web, which we have. Uh, we said, OK, the nodes in this graph are going to be the 20 million most frequent phrases uh, up to length n, uh, up to length 10 in this case. Uh, and we trimmed the phrases to make sure that they weren't just random strings, but that they actually uh, did have some uh, syntactic notion of, of a phrase. Uh, we added each of these uh, phrases uh, as nodes to the graph. And uh, what you get when you do that, uh, you know, you get lots of multi-word expressions. Uh, you get things like vulgarity uh, and, and other uh, things like that. And you get spelling uh, variations. So this could either be intentional spelling variations, like the two here, or just misspellings, right? So you'll get cool with basically any number of O's in between the C and the L in this graph. So where do the edges come from is uh, an important problem here. Uh, again, we're going to appeal to the data. Uh, so basically, we're just going to appeal to uh, Harris's distributional hypothesis and say similar words occur in similar contexts. So this is kind of like uh, word sketches, which uh, a lot of people have talked about. But here we're going to talk about more like document level co-occurrences. So, you know, good, if I look at the probability when I see good of seeing cool, excellent, super nice, uh, that distribution of probabilities is going to be much closer uh, to the word great than it will be to the word awful. So that's my similarity metric that I'm going to use. You can define, we use fairly standard distributional similarity metrics. I don't think that's uh, too important. But once you have a metric like that that you've learned from the data, 
Uh, the way you can uh, add edges is by taking every single node, looking up the k uh, most distributionally similar words, uh, and adding an arc between those words. And so this results in a graph that's OK. Uh, it has a lot of noise. Uh, you get weird things like sweet and sour uh, have an arc between them. Uh, because people mention sweet and sour uh, chicken or sweet and sour whatever. Also, frequent words like good and bad uh, co-occur a lot in documents. So there is actually a strong um, distributional similarity between these kinds of frequent adjectives. So there is noise. There is a lot of noise in this graph. But we're going to try to leverage the more clean WordNet-based graphs uh, in a combination system in order to overcome some of this noise. OK, so the experimental setup. Uh, Basically, we're going to compare two ways of generating these uh, sentiment lexicons. The first is, well, they're both going to use the exact same seed lexicon, the general inquirer, plus we added some morphological variants. Uh, we're going to run the exact same graph propagation algorithms over them. It's just that the first lexical graph is going to be WordNet derived, and the second is going to be this distributional web derived uh, graph. Uh, so before I present the experiments, hopefully this is. Uh, uh, legible. Um, here's what the web-derived lexicon gives you, the kind of information you get. So on the one hand, in both the negative and positive class, uh, you get what you'd expect, you know, a bunch of single word, adjectives, verbs, adverbs uh, that, that clearly convey uh, sentiment. Uh, you get in the positive class a lot of spelling variations, uh, which is nice. And in both the positive and negative class, you get a huge number of multi-word expressions. So you do get this was to die for uh, expression in the list. You also get things like, uh, you know, my favorite is just what the doctor ordered, but you know, flash in the pan and a bunch of other examples. In the negative case, there's kind of a bunch of interesting uh, phenomena that pop up. You know, one is vulgarity, um, which is not surprising because people express negative opinion often with very strong language. Uh, you also got a lot of medical conditions, which on the surface of it, to say like, um, you know, I went to some hospital and I found out I had cancer. I'm not saying something bad about that hospital, but you can think in this distributional setting, cancer is often used in, as an actually to convey negative opinion, uh, but also a lot of other words associated with sicknesses um, convey negative opinion. And if we're taking co-occurrences, then we'll naturally link a word like cancer or another uh, medical disease to a lot of these words. And, and accidentally uh, flow sentiment uh, into them. OK, so the experiment is going to be on classifying sentences. So we build these lexicons, and we're going to uh, pump these lexicons into a classifier, uh, and then uh, measure on a set of sentences that have been labeled whether the classifier predicted the right polarity. Was it positive, negative, neutral, or maybe mixed sentiment? OK, so there's a number of experiments here. Um, the first experiment uh, is when we only use the lexicon in the classifier. So this is a rule-based classifier. Uh, it will basically take the lexicon, count up the number of positive words uh, from the lexicon in the sentence, the number of negative words in the sentence, maybe do something simple like scope and negation uh, to make sure that we correctly negate uh, particular words, and then it'll make a prediction based on that. And already, if we use WordNet as the backbone, we're already getting about 60% uh, accuracy. So it's certainly better than uh, random, uh, but it's not, uh, not great. So we can think of this in the semi-supervised uh, uh, learning paradigm as being the part where we use the dictionaries to constrain some information about um, raw text. The second classifier we're going to call contextual classification. Basically, this is going to be uh, a human labeling some examples of, for us of positive, negative, neutral sentences. And then we're going to train a machine learning algorithm to use the lexicon as features, uh, but try to you know, learn uh, how many lexical items, uh, uh, you know, have features over how many lexical items were matched. What was their syntactic relationship to things like modal verbs or conditionals? Because this kind of information suggests people might be hedging uh, in their opinions that could uh, influence the classification task. 
uh, and a, a bunch of other rich features around negation and other uh, scoping uh, cases. And you can see here uh, we do much, much better uh, because obviously the machine learning algorithm is able to be much more robust than the simple rule-based algorithm. So this is, again, to, to highlight this point, uh, when we take traditional uh, label data and we couple it with constraints we get from dictionaries, uh, we can do much, much better than we were doing before. So the second set of results uh, is going to be when we use the web-derived lexicon um, to make predictions. And we can see when we're only using the rule-based classifier, it does much better. Uh, and this is probably not surprising because it's much larger, so it has much more coverage of the kind of sentences that have been annotated. Uh, this holds uh, over to the contextual classification case, but it definitely you see uh, the gap drop uh, a little bit. I think what's interesting is that these two sources of information, one which is purely distributional, another which is almost purely uh, based on a lexical resource, uh, are complementary. One has high coverage but has a lot of noise, the other has low coverage but is very clean. Uh, so if we combine them, uh, we naturally do the best, right? So in the rule-based system, we basically add a weight of two if the word is in both lexicons. Um, or otherwise a weight of one if it's only in one of the lexicons. And in the contextual classification case, we allow the learner to figure out what subset uh, of the lexicon from each source uh, is reliable. So it'll learn things like common adjectives. Uh, the output from the WordNet-based lexicon is much, much more reliable than, say, the web-derived lexicon. But on these large uh, multi-word phrases, it won't fire any features for the WordNet-based Word lexicon, uh, but the web-based lexicon will fire features. And so by com combining these sources of evidence, we do much better. And now we're in the, we're in the, the space where uh, we can use this kind of accuracy to build um, language technologies. And we do. So if you go to um, Google Shopping and you look up a product, you'll see these sentiment summaries, and these are built using these kinds of uh, algorithms. Okay, so before I stop, um, just a few more examples. So I only highlighted a couple case studies uh, since I was involved in that work, but the field has been doing a lot more uh, in general using dictionaries or lexical ontologies uh, to improve um, uh, natural language processing. So recently there's been a lot of traction with Wiktionary um, for reasons that it is widely available and it's in lots of different languages. Uh, so we see that being used to improve semantic parsers, syntax, uh, word census ambiguation, all sorts of tasks like this. And that's true for WordNet. WordNet, that's been true for um, basically since its first release. Um, and so these sorts of, of dictionaries uh, are widely used. An interesting study has come out recently on uh, morphological paradigm learning. So the idea here is uh, for some dictionaries where we don't have full coverage of all the inflected forms uh, for all the words in the dictionary, uh, we may uh, take the words that do have uh, the inflected forms and try to automatically learn based on how those words occur in corpora uh, or regularities between the suffixes, uh, prefixes of those words. For the words that we don't have the inflected forms for, what are the true inflected forms of those words? Uh, and we're actually launching this week or next week a new Google Angram viewer where you can ask uh, in the search to just not only look for the, the, the words in the search, but also all the inflected forms uh, of the words. So we've done this for uh, a number of different languages. One thing I haven't talked uh, about is bilingual dictionaries. And, and there's obvious machine translation, there's obvious applications, and people have been using bilingual dictionaries. Even in the revolutionized statistical machine translation uh, field, dictionaries have, have always been uh, important there. Uh, but beyond translation, uh, these kinds of dictionaries are being leveraged for cross-lingual syntactic analysis, cross-lingual uh, information retrieval, search engine results, resource construction. Uh, one interesting uh, application, which I'm going to talk about because it's uh, in the current Google Translate uh, interface, is these bilingual sense clusters. So this is, this is a work by some colleagues of mine um, where they took a bilingual dictionary, uh, a bunch of uh, corpora, bilingual corpora, but not aligned bilingual corpora. Uh, and what they tried to do is find for a given English word uh, and all the foreign uh, translations of that word, they tried to figure out ways of clustering the English, other English words 
uh, to give the user a sense of what that particular sense of that foreign uh, word is uh, by appealing to their uh, knowledge of English. And so, I don't know, as a language learner, I find this quite useful uh, when I want the, the actual sense uh, of the word. And so this is largely uh, automatically generated from data um, just using a bilingual dictionary. Okay. So in summary, after 20 years of statistical advances, um, 20 years of improved online resources, uh, in particular in terms of their internationalization and their coverage, I think we're at an interesting point in language technology uh, where we can start leveraging these resources at scale uh, and basically complementing their strengths with the uh, high coverage strengths of statistical uh, learning techniques. And we're already seeing it uh, happen. I would say today we're just kind of skimming the surface. The kind of information I've been using from dictionaries, you know, what part of speech tags uh, are licensed for words, or what are the synonym sets uh, for those words, uh, I think are, you know, just uh, a very small aspect of what we can use. In particular, since we're given those words in context, uh, we're given the definitions of those words, uh, and we can commute maybe some kind of semantic similarity between definitions, uh, we should be able to leverage all that information um, to build even more accurate uh, technologies. So that's it. Thank you very much. Okay. Questions, yes. So yes, thank you very much. And uh, the first part of 20 years was reflecting quite well my life as a researcher in the <laughs> NLP field, <laughs> going to all of the rule-based and statistical. I have a question on the, on the, so my name is Thierry Declerc from Academy in Vienna. Um, on the lexicon for sentiment analysis, uh, I'm aware of some lexicon that use five features, positive, negative, neutral, shift, attensifier. So uh, is this a plus or a minus? What do you see with your results? Would it improve? Uh, so, so yeah. So in, in our particular experiments, uh, in, you know, so in particular with intensifiers, because we're getting multi-word phrases, you'll see something like "very good" has a higher sentiment score than just "good," or you know, "somewhat good" is a little lower sentiment uh, intensity uh, than "good." But we're not doing anything compositional. Uh, so there has been a lot of work um, since we published that on trying to not only figure out what those intensifiers are, other upward, downward entailment operators are, uh, but putting those together to do some kind of compositional inference uh, in the field. And the results so far have been pretty good. Um, and so I, I think it's, it's a, 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 there's a lot of leverage we can get there. But well, our work, we weren't doing that. We were just kind of relying on the fact that if there's such an intensifier, uh, it would occur in some multi-word uh, expression and we would match that string. Adam? Oh, yes, sir. Question, question about the morphology. Um, the, the, uh, you know, English is a language which, apart from Chinese, has about less morphology than any other language, and that's kind of often deprioritized de -prioritized morphology. Um, and you need morphology to get from the word in the corpus to the word in the dictionary for the part of speech tagging, for example. So, um, and, you know, so actually, is it not a bit of a sort of weak spot when you extend to not just 10 or 20 or 30, but 100 languages? Yeah, so um, that, I think that, that's definitely a weak spot. What I will say is that Wiktionary does have a lot of the inflections. Uh, and I think what's important with these models is uh, not that you necessarily, you know, when you're learning a part of speech taking model, not that you necessarily have all inflected forms in the dictionary, but at least enough of each uh, uh, class so that the model can learn based on suffix features, prefix features, or some kind of morphologic, you know, morphologically driven feature, uh, what the right analysis might be. So it's okay if, if, if a particular inflection isn't in the dictionary, as long as we see enough uh, from that class uh, of words to learn uh, something. Sorry. There are 170 dictionaries, but aren't they? Zipfian distributed for oh, size. Oh, yeah, yeah. So when I say we can build part of speech taggers for 170 languages, I'm not saying they're all going to be 93% accurate. Um, yeah, so if you look at the distribution, I think there's one in there that has like a single word uh, in it, right? And so we'll have extremely good accuracy on that word, but uh, we'll probably do pretty poorly ev everywhere else. So, yeah, I think take that with a grain of salt. <laughs> yes. 
So, uh, Christian Meyer from Darmstadt University. Um, I've just a related question to the part of speech tagger. So, if the word is not covered in a dictionary, then you kind of allow all part of speech tags. But if it is in a dictionary, then you kind of assume that all part of speech tags are in there. Don't you punish those cases where a part of speech tag is missing kind of over proportionally hard? Is that a problem to your model? Yeah, it's, it's definitely a problem. Um, you know, there's ways of getting around this in the statistical model uh, via regularization uh, or something like that. But yeah, ultimately, if there's poor coverage uh, for part of speech tags, there's, there's going to be a problem. I think the key is that that, coverage can't, that poor coverage can't be systematic, right? So we can't be, say, um, you know, for a certain class of words, uh, they, they're all missing the same part of speech analysis in the dictionary. Uh, as long as that uh, coverage is not systematic and it overlaps, uh, the statistical model should be able to pick up on that particular deficiency, if it's, if it's a good statistical model. So. Elon? Referring to the last bilingual part of your presentation, what does Google Translate need in order to improve? Well, a lot. <laughs> um, I would say, so, I, I have a number of different things to say here. Um, you know, one of the biggest pain points for Google Translate are things like uh, pronoun resolution. Uh, so pronoun, you, pronouns get dropped in certain languages, uh, and then when we're translating that sentence where it's dropped, uh, we have to actually figure out which pronoun to use, so we have to do something like uh, source side, uh, co-reference, uh, anaphora resolution, uh, which we're not doing. Um, so I think we can improve uh, a lot there. Certainly, on the <laughs> okay. <laughs> Certainly on the uh, target side morphology uh, uh, case, you know, we, we, we can translate words, but we often get the, uh, the morphology uh, incorrect, the case markers. Uh, whatever. This is largely uh, because word order might change dramatically and the language model uh, isn't uh, prepared for that. So I think understanding uh, the source side at the syntactic level, uh, which the current systems are already doing for a lot of, of languages, but leveraging that more to get the word order uh, correct and the, and the idiom usage correct so that the target side uh, morphology systems can uh, make better predictions, I think will uh, greatly improve translation. So these are the kinds of errors where you know, we have the wrong inflection or we use the wrong gender pronoun or something like that that really drives uh, users uh, insane. And I think like targeting these kinds of, of analyses uh, is where we'll get the biggest improvement. And then on top of that, you know, more data. We have, uh, uh, I think currently Google Translate does 60, 70 languages, which is a lot. Um, the accuracy is pretty good for uh, European languages. Uh, it's pretty good for Chinese. Um, but certainly for uh, other languages uh, like Japanese, it falls short. Um, Japanese is maybe less an issue of more data and more an issue of better syntactic analysis. But in general, more data always uh, helps out. Uh, I would like to still uh, return to the morphology. Uh, does the semi-supervised approach work uh, also for highly inflected languages like Slavic languages when you have over 100 inflected forms for, for one, one verb, for example? Yeah, so um, it's not my field of expertise, uh, but I do know some people working, say, on Semitic languages. Uh, and there, it's essentially a semi-supervised approach that they use. So they will use um, a morphological dictionary to constrain the lattice, uh, and then they'll push mass uh, uh, towards analyses. That's kind of the state of the art in that space. Um, not speaking any Semitic languages, I don't know if those accuracies are acceptable enough, but they're... Slavic. Yeah. I know, I know, but I, I... And also, I mean, people in the Czech Republic uh, do basically the, the same kind of thing. They have a lot more labeled data because they've been annotating data for many, many years. Um, and so there they don't necessarily need a semi-supervised uh, approach. But in the case of some Semitic languages, 
which you might. Um, this is what people do. This is kind of the state of the art. Uh, so whether that's good enough, I guess, is a subjective uh, question. So since you have an access to all of this data, mm -hmm. what is the sentiment of the web? Is it more positive or negative? <laughs> <laughs> I, okay, yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> so what I, I do know is that um, we, we obviously looked at a lot of things in local search and product search, uh, since that is the natural place to apply these things at a company like Google. And we did notice that depending on what was being reviewed, the distribution changed. So for instance, music was almost entirely positive. And there's kind of, uh, at least in the English-speaking world, I think, there is a uh, phenomenon there where people don't want to admit that they bought bad music. Uh, and so people only leave positive reviews about uh, a particular CD they have. And so you see kind of funny things like that, but I don't know if it's overall positive or negative. I'm sure uh, with the recent issues in the US, if you uh, ran it on a bunch of blogs today, you'd probably get a, a negative outcome, but I don't know. Uh, yes, just to complement what Adam was saying before, I mean, there are maybe 180 dictionaries, but English dictionaries covering more than 400 languages. So inside the English dictionary, there are entries for so many languages, so uh, we also would need something else. My other point, you were mentioning uh, the parallel corpora from the Commission, from the European Commission dictionary. Yeah. Uh, but uh, how do they differ from Google data, I mean, for your work? Yeah. And maybe could you also sometimes provide for some data that could be used by the community at large, like dictionary and similar? Well, um, so dictionary is provided. Uh, you can just download it from the website. Uh, you, yeah, but the parallel data, um, right, so how does uh, uh, the European uh, Parliament, uh, parliamentary proceedings differ from Google? We have a lot more of it. So um, we have translations of books uh, trans that have been generated by humans, um, translations of news articles. Uh, we also have graph mining techniques uh, that go out and try to figure out automatically from uh, using bilingual dictionaries uh, when two uh, websites are translations of each other, and we try to grab that data as well, carefully trying to make sure that that translation was not generated by Google, that it is actually a le legitimate translation. Um, so there's significantly more of it, and it covers many more genres. Whether we can release it, um, I'm actually not on the machine translation team, so uh, I can't say anything there. <laughs> Okay, one last question. Yes. Um, um, sorry about this, but I have to ask, in, in the Google vocabulary in seven, ten years, will the word dictionary in the sense we know it now exist? Uh, will it be an app of some kind, or will it be something completely different? Oh, well, <laughs> I mean, I think it'll exist. Um, it'll, like, I think... That's a hard question. I say like any word, our, our, our view of its meaning will probably shift uh, slightly. Um, probably to mean much more linked data uh, than was historically true up until 20 years ago. Um, but I mean, I think dictionaries will live on for a long time. I mean, people want them. <laughs> and on, on that note, <laughs> we can, uh, um, thank you again. Fine. Thank you.